Hello, my name is Dr. Adrian Harrison. I'm the inventor of the Curo, the acoustic myography system, and I'm very pleased that you'll join us today to take part in what proves to be quite an exciting and full events uh, program today with not only lectures that go into detail about the various uh, goals that are identified in the race program, but also showing you how to use the Curo in real time with horses, and then following up with some of the more scientific publications that we have produced and exam questions to make sure that you fully understand this technique and its potential. I hope you enjoy the rest of the lecture series today and um, take part in further events that we have planned. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody, to Acoustic Myography, Revealing the Unseen. Well, Dr. Michael Torres received his Doctor of Medicine from Spartan Health Sciences University and his Master in Business Administration degree from Toro University International. Dr. Torres is board certified in family medicine and healthcare quality management. He is retired also from the United States Air Force. Dr. Torres has a passion for improving patient safety, assuring patient-centered care, elevating healthcare quality in all patient care settings, and leadership education for physicians to achieve those goals. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Torres to discuss Curo in a human clinic Top. setting. Dr. Torres, so much for joining us. I know you have a great uh, presentation for us, but tell us a little bit about the Curo Clinic app, uh, how it is used in human uh, medical modalities. So today, you, a lot has been talked about how it can be used in the animal world, the equine world, the canine world, and others. Um, the, the same modality can be utilized as a diagnostic biofeedback device in the human population and some of the things that I'll discuss is how it can be used in rehabilitation, how it can be used in athletes to determine where there's lack of symmetry in muscle strength, where they, where they now have a risk of injury because they have asymmetric strength. Okay. Um, also, we can, I'm going to talk about some diseases where we have been able to identify early diagnostic changes, including things like Parkinson's disease, including things like fibromyalgia. So those are the things that I'm going to discuss today. This, this technology is opening our eyes to so many things with yes. muscles. Yes, it absolutely Incredible. is. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. I know you have a great presentation for us, and Thank so you. I'm going to let you take over from Thank there. You. I'm so. going to go up to the slides. Yes, sir. Right. So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I hope you can see the slides because I'm showing them. Um, first slide is just a representation oh, of the uh, no. transmitter for the Kiro um, MK2. Uh, it connects to the sensor, which is on the body, um, and then it transmits either using Bluetooth or uh, Wi-Fi capability. We can actually go live to a satellite and then transmit it to anywhere in the world. And so there are some. Um, things that we are looking at and having conversations with uh, organizations such as the Department of Defense, uh, the law enforcement community, uh, and NASA because uh, the ability of this device yeah. to be able yeah. to detect uh, muscle strength, muscle symmetry um, has uh, implications in all of those areas, uh, space flight, 
um, the muscle effects when someone is exposed to a I toxin so. such as a nerve this agent or uh, an opiate. Uh, and so uh, that is work that is being done. I mean, it's preliminary, but uh, it is work that is being done. Munich. Uh, we've already discussed earlier today how uh, the Curo wow. device using uh, acoustic myography uh, is able to uh, identify um, the function of muscle. Um, uh, I know Dr. Harrison showed this slide earlier. Um, this happens to be the bicep muscle on uh, the left-hand side, and it, it allows us to be able to see function of the muscle all the way down to the muscle fibers and even to individual cells at times. Um, this slide showing the methodology of uh, how this device um, checks all the boxes, even better than uh, electromyography because um, with the electromyography it is difficult for the EMG to be able to identify recruitment of individual fibers or quantity of fibers. Um, and certainly the electromyography tends to be done in a more static type of testing. Um, and so it is uh, not something that uh, gives us muscle function during activity. Um, the uh, CT scan, the MR scan, traditional x-ray and ultrasound, um, as well as uh, biopsy, none of those can give us all of the things that uh, the uh, EMG or AMG can give us. Uh, both EMG and AMG can give us fiber composition, can give us identification of areas of injury on muscle um, and uh, can also um, tell us about if the muscle is being used. But EMG, like I said, cannot tell us whether fibers are being recruited or the quantity of fibers that are being recruited, uh, nor can it uh, measure uh, activity of the muscle during uh, its use. And so those are two things that um, makes the uh, acoustic myography superior to the electromyography. Um, you've seen a slide earlier today of a animal brain. Um, this slide depicts the same thing. Voluntary movement begins as a thought in the prefrontal cortex. Um, it then, that, that thought moves through the basal nuclei where planning of the movement takes place. Um, the thalamus does modulation. Uh, the cerebellum does the fine tuning and in the brain stem and at the top of the spinal cord you start to get the posturing of the muscle and then the uh, impulse runs down the spinal cord to the muscle that's been selected by the prefrontal cortex and basal nuclei for actual contraction. So the fact that I'm doing this to make my arm move is all happening in that sequence that you see on this slide. The acoustic myography allows us to look at the efficiency and the synchronization. Uh, to, that's the E-score. Uh, the spatial summation, the number of active fibers that are actually being pulled together to work, that is the S-score. And then the rate of firing of those fibers, which is the temporal summation, and that is the T-score. So the EST-score uh, is uh, something that we are able to track on a graph and that is uh, what we are able to use uh, as a representation of the findings of the acoustic myography. In our next slide you are looking at um, the, uh, oh, I think I skipped one, excuse me, here we go. In the EMG um, you see differences, the upper bicep, middle bicep, and lower bicep on the picture of the arm and you can see differences in the uh, graphs that are put out by the EMG because electromyography is positional uh, variability, um, uh, something that happens. If you move the sensor, you get a different graph. With acoustic myography, you can see that no matter where the sensor is placed, the graphs look essentially similar. And that is another advantage with acoustic myography because you do not need to be anywhere near as precise on the human. And certainly the muscle groups on the human tend to be smaller than those on, on the equine, although they are larger than the canine or the, or the cat. Uh, but still, 
Um, if you get it on the muscle anywhere, whether it's the origin, the belly, or the insertion of that muscle, you're going to be able to um, pick up an EST score that is essentially the same regardless of where you have placed the sensors. And so that is another advantage to this. Um, there are a number of applications that have been identified and published already in the medical literature with uh, clinical trials. Um, and so we now know that um, a um, um, early uh, diagnosis of um, cerebral palsy is, uh, is possible. We're able to identify that the, and I will cover this in a future slide, but we're able to identify that there is uh, a, a diminution of muscle fiber activity as the CP patient uh, starts to tire. Um, we are also able to um, do isokinetic measurements, that was the BioDEX trial, um, and we are also able to look at spinal reflex. In fact, a patient that um, I personally was involved with was someone who um, had a um, um, set of imaging studies, both CT scan and MRI, that showed degeneration in the lumbar spine from L3 to, uh, to S1. Um, and uh, so that was lumbar 3, lumbar 4, lumbar 5, and sacral 1. Um, the, uh, that patient, however, also had a significant amount of discomfort in the SI joint of the leg that was affected. Um, we were able to place the curo on that patient and identify that the dysfunction went all the way up to the spinal cord itself and was not limited at the site of the um, uh, sacroiliac joint. Um, so that individual was able to see a practitioner with a significant amount of confidence that it was not their SI joint that was the cause of their discomfort, but was actually the spinal dys dysfunction that had been identified in the CT scan and MRI. Um, we have evidence that shows that we can uh, use this in diagnosing um, ALS, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, uh, early detection of uh, cerebral palsy patients. Uh, we also have um, identified and have published information on uh, Parkinson's patients that shows uh, muscle dysfunction at early stages of Parkinsonism, which allows us to make recommendations and diagnoses early. And as I said when I was talking with Tom, we also have an objective test now that will allow us to identify uh, pathognomonic patterns on patients with fibromyalgia. One of the studies with the cerebral palsy patients, and these are preclinical tests, um, myography functional assessment of CP patients compared to healthy living controls. And what you can see is that the dark circles on the left-hand graph are the CP patients the white uh, uh, squares are the controls, and you can see that there's a difference in the findings between both. The findings indicate that those patients who have been diagnosed with cerebral palsy have a higher degree of spatial summation, uh, and they're recruiting more fibers in order to be able to do the same function, uh, in order to be able to keep up the same speed on a treadmill. And what we find is that these individuals have a tendency to, to recruit more muscle fibers and that that is why these patients tend to experience, we suspect that is why these patients uh, experience premature fatigue and why cerebral palsy patients are constantly uh, fatiguing because they have to recruit more muscle fiber and therefore burn more energy in order to be able to do something that a patient who does not have CP is able to do much more easily. In Parkinson's disease, you see the patient here just doing hand movements Okay, and what we have found is that uh, the patients with Parkinson's disease um, on one type of movement are using less fibers than control groups, and on another type of movement are uh, having uh, an increased uh, fiber use. Um, and so, and it's, it is uh, asymmetrical. So in order to do this motion, you're using more fibers of one hand or one arm, one part of the arm and less on the other. And to do this motion, it reverses. And so this is shown by the graphs where you can see uh, that the Parkinson patients, which are in green, um, again, are different compared to the control. Um, Dr. Harrison and uh, the university in Copenhagen is uh, now doing a 
review through the Ethics Committee and the Institutional Review Board to do a double-blinded study in this area, and we hope to have more information on this in the future uh, when that study is completed and, and published. Um, in Parkinson's patients, um, you can see differences here between uh, bicep and tricep of patients with Parkinson and patients without Parkinson. And what we have found is that there is motor dysfunction that is reproducible across multiple Parkinson's patients in both the spatial and the temp temporal summation. It makes it possible for us, because it is reproducible across multiple patients, to be able to diagnose at a much earlier stage the onset of Parkinson's disease. This information was just recently uh, introduced to the world of uh, Parkinson's research at the International Congress on Movement Disorders, which was held just earlier this year uh, in uh, the European Union. Um, and uh, there was a tremendous amount of discussion there and interest in, in that work. And I know that Dr. Harrison has been contacted by a number of uh, universities across the world to take that information and reproduce the studies. Um, we suspect that it will be reproducible, and we suspect that what we have identified is a way to be able to um, uh, diagnose Parkinson's disease earlier than anything we currently have available in the toolbox for uh, the uh, human medicine world. We have um, done some early tests in patients with um, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, you see a patient here that is uh, wired for uh, the um, acoustic myography. Uh, what we did with this patient was that they did 21 days of um, sequential episodes of using a TENS unit that's a transcutaneic electric nerve stimulator. Okay, so that's a nerve stimulation that forces the muscle. Think about what happens to us if we get um, shot with a, a taser device. Okay, it is a much lower amplitude, but it makes the muscle jerk. And so with that, they were able to train the muscle and strengthen the muscle. And you can see here that in the left arm, the AMG signal uh, was at, uh, measured at a 4.9 before the 21 days of TENS stimulation, and it went to a 5.2. And the right arm went from a 3.2 to a 5.9. So a much better response on the right arm than the left, but both arms showed significant improvement. And uh, so we believe that there is a utility in the utilization of the um, uh, acoustic myography in identifying earlier uh, patients with Parkinson's and then beginning the process of actually training the muscles to be stronger uh, using TENS devices or other forms of uh, electro um, stimulation for the muscle. Um, so, again, it's a diagnostic tool, and, and we feel very strongly that it can be utilized on that. Um, in patients that have myasthenia gravis, um, that's a disease that unfortunately renders them unable to be able to clear anesthesia from the body. And so it is potentially lethal to give someone with myasthenia gravis general anesthesia. Um, what we have been able to show is that the um, acoustic myography is able, allows us to be able to identify um, how the muscle fibers are working in the people with myasthenia gravis. And even to the point where when comparing it to EMG, electromyography, and utilizing what you can see in the picture on the bottom right hand side, uh, that is a uh, uh, myasthenia patient who's wearing a skull cap and you can see uh, on the skull cap uh, diagram just to the left of the picture, um, the different colors for the sensors. We are actually um, I identifying and measuring corticomuscular coherence. And what we're finding is that um, we are, are able to link up the acoustic myography signals from the muscle with those signals that are being measured in the brain, and there's coherence there. EMG doesn't give us that. So we believe that there's going to be a way to utilize um, in neuromuscular disorders across the board, not just myasthenia gravis, uh, acoustic myography as a way, as an adjunct to earlier diagnosis uh, of how the patient's neuromuscular dysfunction is progressing. 
Um, there are also some sports medicine implications for this. Um, in rehabilitation, the Curo MK2 acoustic myography has been, has been able to determine which muscles are affected after an injury. We're, it's been utilized extensively in the equine and the canine world. We believe there is utility for utilization of this in the rehabilitation of injured individuals, whether that be an athlete, whether that be someone who was injured in a car accident or a slip and fall. Um, but also, we can monitor the rehabilitation progress. And on the bottom of the left-hand side of this slide, you can see what we call the delta, the difference between an unhurt muscle and a hurt muscle. And at the, at the early stage of the uh, rehabilitation, the difference was huge. So the unhurt muscle is at the bottom of that graph. The hurt muscle's findings are at the top of the graph. And over approximately 150 days, you can see very early on the muscle rehabilitation brought it down, but as we continue with the specific rehabilitation of the injured muscle, it moves further down towards becoming equal. And it actually equalizes at about 120 to 210 days. So it can be used as a guide, not only in identifying which muscle groups need rehabilitation, but also used as a guide in identifying the progress of rehabilitation so that we continue the therapy on an injured individual long enough to get them to the point where the difference between the injured and the uninjured muscle is now negligible. That brings up the fact then that we can also utilize the same technology to look at re prehabilitation of people, okay? Where someone who is an athlete and has injured muscle, or excuse me, has unequal strength in muscle, um, is now at a risk of developing an injury in the stronger muscle because they use the stronger side in order to be able to compensate for the weaker side. And so you take someone who is a competitive athlete of any sport, okay, and now the um, stronger muscle is at a higher risk of injury because it's being used more to compensate. And so we, we, we use in the rehabilitation and in the sports medicine world, we use the word prehabilitation. And what this is is a tool that will allow us to be able to look at elite athletes or high school athletes and identify whether they are at risk for injury because of the asymmetry in their muscles. Lastly, we can use real-time exercise monitoring. And I don't know if you saw on the camera Dr. Harrison come through with the, uh, with the uh, penny farthing, but um, this is a picture of him actually riding on this slide. Um, and because of our ability to transmit to the Internet using satellite technology, we can actually do real-time monitoring of medical, uh, excuse me, of muscle activity um, with medical oversight. So a physician can be, or someone trained to, to interpret the um, uh, graph from the uh, acoustic myography um, is, uh, is able to identify what's going on. And it is this technology that allows us to talk about the ability to utilize this because there is muscle changes in individuals who have been exposed to opiates. There are muscle changes, and as you heard in my introduction, I'm retired from the U.S. military, there are muscle changes that take place when a service member is exposed to a nerve agent in a wartime environment. And so we are having conversations uh, about getting the studies done to be able to do that as well. Um, and so that, that is the last thing that I wish to discuss, and I want to thank Dr. Harrison for coming through and showing us how he can ride his his uh, tremendous uh, uh, bicycle. Um, and the, the graph you see on this slide um, is actually uh, Dr. Harrison uh, wired up with the Curo. Um, and you can see that he is pushing off. You can see when the muscle activity shows that he's climbing up onto it, when he's slow cycling, when he's fast cycling, when he stops, and when he dismounts. And all of that can be correlated just by the muscle activity from where the curos were placed on his body. Um, so we believe that we have uh, a technology here that is going to make a tremendous difference in multiple areas across human medicine. Um, and uh, I'm certainly uh, willing to 
uh, answer any of your questions. And the last slide just shows how you can contact us. Dr. Torres, uh, thank you, first of all. Fascinating information. Uh, uh, what do you learn uh, as time goes by more and more about the Kiro and how it uh, affects humans, how, what you learn about the muscles in humans? You know, what's fascinating to me is the wide breadth of areas where we have some uh, ability to improve diagnoses and to do it earlier. You know, um, obviously it makes common sense that if you can diagnose a disease earlier, then you can begin an appropriate therapy earlier. And the earlier you treat, the better outcomes you have in the long term. Okay. Do, do you find that it gives you uh, almost a crystal ball into what, dependent on the person, dependent on the human and what their muscle makeup is, it gives you an idea of what could be happening for them with those muscles down the road. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we, have, we have done some non-scientific studies, for example, on bodybuilders. And they're amazed when we show them that, you know, they think they've gotten both sides of their body fine-tuned and we're able to show them, you know, on a graph that here it is. You know, the one side is not as strong as the other. Okay? And uh, they thought that they were, they, it looked the same. Mm -hmm. You know, they were bulked. You know what I'm saying? But, but the muscles were not symmetrical. And, uh, and they were at a higher risk of injury because of that lack of symmetry. So, um, you know, even in the bodybuilding or the strength building uh, area, which I didn't discuss because we've not done scientific studies on that, but anecdotally, we've tried it with some bodybuilders, and what we have found is we can actually help guide their training. So back to the prehab. Yeah. And last question, and along, just to kind of play off of that, uh, just to play off of that, uh, People, bodybuilders, or whoever it may be, can find out what their strengths are within their body, what muscles are, yes. uh, you know, naturally stronger, and which ones are maybe naturally weaker. Sure. And so, you know, in our country and across the world, there's this big push for functional medicine, you know, for alternative medicine. Um, in the world of functional medicine, I think about how this could help us identify where your muscles are not functioning as effectively on one side or the other and allow you to build a, a prehabilitation program to make yourself stronger where it shows that you're weaker. What are some of the things that you see happening down the road that this technology will help uh, the medical world with as time goes by and we learn more about it? Sure. So, for example, you know, in my military career, I was a flight surgeon, and I was exposed to people with the space program, okay? Um, and we're talking about long-term space, all right? Uh, travel to the Mars or travel back to the moon and, and to have a space station there. And certainly, we've had people that have been in the International Space Station for a year, yeah. right? Muscle atrophies in space. And so identifying the cause of that atrophy, I believe that this is something, and we've actually sent a research proposal to NASA to see whether or not there's any interest, okay, on utilizing this technology as a way of looking at muscle function real time in space, okay, so that we can begin to identify why it is that our muscles on our, on our astronauts get weaker over time in microgravity. So that's just one example. Okay, um, I, I alluded to the function of uh, being able to identify a um, uh, dysfunction in muscle that can be correlated to exposure to a toxin, whether that be an opiate, whether that be a nerve agent in the war zone. So imagine the ability to have this device on our soldiers, sailors, marines, airmen in a deployed environment. Again, I'm putting on my retired military hat. Okay, yeah. in a deployed environment, and our enemies use a you know gas on us, and and we, it's odorless, it's colorless. We don't know it until people start to drop. Only we were they were wearing this device, and it it recognized a change in muscle function before they dropped, and they're able to get their gas masks on, and we save lives. So I, that's just yeah. two things that come off the top of my head that I'm aware of. 
that you know, future research will need to bear out what my vision is. Sure. Okay. I'm I, I'm driven by data and evidence. Okay. Right now, I have conjecture based upon critical thinking and knowing what we know about what this can do for us. All right. That research has to take place, and we're moving in those directions. That's fascinating. The the military. Uh, th things that happen in outer space, but even back to uh, just ordinary folks who, you know, perhaps will they be able to know their body a little bit more now Absolutely. To, to be able to know what they should and can do more of as life plays out <clears throat> and what things that maybe they should stay away from with that knowledge about their muscles and about their body. Exactly, exactly. So, it, it, you know, applications for... Uh, individuals, uh, the, recently here in Florida, within the last year, there was a, sh uh, a sheriff's deputy that was doing a search of a vehicle, and uh, the, when he opened the trunk, uh, fentanyl powder uh, hit him, and he inhaled fentanyl powder and was going down. Uh, luckily, there was another deputy there that was able to administer Narcan and kept that deputy alive. What if that deputy had been alone? Mm. Well, if the deputy had been alone and was wearing this device, it, it, because of our ability to upload Okay, if it's being monitored, we'd be able to identify that there was something else. Fascinating stuff. Okay, so just another, another application. Yeah. Okay, and we've already shown that. Yeah. All right, but just another application. Very good, very good. The, future's, the future is uh, incredible. I mean, it, it, uh, and I think as years go by, the more that we learn, the more testing that happens, the more trial and error that happens. It's got to excite you uh, for all the new things that you will learn as you know each year goes by and, and your experience with it plays out. It does. All right. Absolutely. Dr. Michael Torres, we really appreciate a there terrific presentation and all of your knowledge uh, and wisdom on this topic. Thank you very much. All right.